All righty, folks. What is going on with rents? More specifically, what is going on with multifamily rents and single family rents? And we should also talk about home construction. Uh, there is a collection of 11 surveys talking about what's going on in home construction. And of course, we turn to Lance Lambert from Resi Club to get all of our housing, housing, housing information. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. And yeah, housing, housing, housing. There's always a lot going on. There's also a tremendous amount of misinformation <laughs> at any given one no. time. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things that's occurring in the marketplace is we've seen a pretty sharp deceleration in rent growth. Uh, we have a lot of multifamily supply and apartment supply coming into the market. And even more so this year, it'll actually be the highest since Richard Nixon was president on oh, a total wow. unit basis. And so we have a lot of multifamily supply coming in that was financed at very low rates and it takes a while to get into the marketplace. And economics is supply and demand. So if you have a lot of supply, it puts you know decelerated pressure on price growth. And when you look at the numbers, uh, and I can pull it up in a second, but single fam multifamily rents, and let me just get the number to make sure I'm right, uh, rose 2.7% last year. And okay. that's a pretty big deceleration from the pandemic times when in 2021, they were up 15.8% for oh. multifamily and uh, apartment wow. rents. Yeah. And in 2022, they were still up 6.5%. And so for some perspective, in 2016, apartment and multifamily rents grew 3.2%. Then in 2017, they were up 3.3%. 2018, they were up 36 2019, they were up 3.4. 2020, they actually fell 2% on multi because you know a lot of people were leaving the cities and all of that sure. stuff. And then boom, 2021 up 15.8. So 2.7% is decelerated certainly, but it's not you know deflation. They're still rising. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But here's the thing that's getting missed. That's multifamily and apartment. We exactly. don't have a lot of supply on the single family side. The, thing, the single family market, still very tight. Vacancies, uh, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, vacant homes, va mm -hmm. vacant single family homes. And so what we have actually seen, despite mortgage rates going up from 3% to over 7%, single family rents rose 4.6% last year. Wow. And... Uh, for some comparison, in 2019, they were up 4.4, and in 2018, 4.7. So essentially, the normal levels of single-family right. growth. Now, they have decelerated from 13% in 2021 and 8.5% in 2022. And oh, by the way, when multifamily rents fell 2% in 2020, single-family was still up 6.5. And mm -hmm. that's the reason that overall rents still rose that year. Um, and so we have some bifurcation in the market where the multifamily is much weaker, much softer, outright declines in Phoenix and Austin. And then the single family market nationally, nowhere is down. Uh, you know, you could find like Austin that's kind of flat for single family rents, but essentially everywhere rose and you still have some uh, growth that is, you know, elevated uh, above pre-pandemic levels. And let me just share my screen so people can see the numbers that I'm talking about here. So, mm -hmm. so here's the data, here's single family rents. You can see this real dark area. That's the yep. overheating during the pandemic housing boom. And then we came off of it, but you know, these aren't decreases. This is just normal rates of single family rent growth. And in of these 40 markets, not one is down for single family rents last year. The closest you can get is Austin, and that's Austin, <laughs> where yeah. prices are actually down, house prices 10, 15%. Austin was flat year over year uh, wow. for single family rent. And then you scroll down, here's multi. And you can see, you know, multi up 2.7 for the year, but you know, you have Dallas down just a tad, Atlanta down a little bit, Phoenix, San Francisco down a little bit. I mean, nothing too crazy. I mean, Austin is down three and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do from peak, they're actually down 7%. Right. Uh, but, you know, so the multifamily side of the market, much weaker than the single, but still overall rents rose last year. Right. Um, so I, I think uh, the thing to be cautious of when you see these headlines about rent falling is just to 
you know, know there's a big difference between single family and the apartment and multi side of the market. And also some of the headlines about falling rents on the multifamily and apartment side, so far they've been a little exaggerated, um, is my view. They, <laughs> you mean the doomers are taking one statistic and making it sound like the entire market? I'm shocked. I'm shocked, Lance. Tell me that's not true. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, uh, exaggeration when it comes to housing data is, you know, it, it's kind of off the charts. Uh, you well, really... I, you know, I, I'll say this. I know you won't. There are people out there that that look at maybe what's going on in Austin and they extrapolate that to the nation. That is so beyond the realm of okay is is to be almost criminal, but that doesn't stop them from doing it. Austin, yeah. Austin is the entire country, you know. Yeah, and have I brought up the fact that for Austin house prices, so nationally we peaked at year over year growth for house prices at like twenty twenty one percent in Case Shiller. At sure. one point, Austin was up forty percent year over year. Oh the year over year metric for Austin house prices was up 40 year over year and Boise was too. So a part wow. of the reason that even, you know, people like myself even focused on those markets is because, you know, they probably were be going to be more susceptible to price declines because nobody really ever has went up 40%. No, that's market. so unhealthy. Yeah. In yeah. a year. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and on a month, month over month basis, there were some that were 4%. In a month. In a month. Yeah. Yeah. Where well, that economy, that explains why Austin is yeah, in trouble. It was just yeah, it was off the charts. They overheated to a degree that it, I mean, you think the national market overheated? Austin was like on a a whole other playing field, which is why even though this big drop yeah. in prices, you know, they're still up forty percent from pre pandemic yeah. even with yeah. that blow off the top. Yeah, so let's let, let's uh, switch gears I, I into the your old son Leo in the background. If you hear anybody yelling. Oh, no, we love Leo. If he wants to come say hi, we'd love to see him. I get the audience. It's like, hey, Leo. You yeah, say hi. He said no. No, not today. All right, buddy. Next time. Um, so again, when we think about rents and you hear about rents, realize that a lot of people quote multifamily. Certainly in my feed, when people are attacking me, they're quoting multifamily, not single family. I think a lot of the national reports are multifamily oriented. So just understand when you're seeing stats, it's they're not all equal. And as Lance has clearly showed in Resi Club, single family and multifamily are vastly different markets when it comes to rentals. So uh, we appreciate that, Lance. But uh, let's switch gears. There is apparently somebody who consolidated 11 surveys about home construction. Let's give her a shout out. She's a new member of the team. And uh, let's let's talk about what that yeah, was. So Megan Malice, I hired her at Fortune Magazine uh, I had met her because uh, I, I had studied economics and journalism. I was a dual major at UC, University of Cincinnati. And I was the first person to do that major because the journalism one was new. And it's actually a pain in the butt because you have to do all the prereqs for both of the colleges, the Ooh. College of Business and the Arts and Sciences. And Megan had reached out because that was also her major. Uh, oh. She came in, you know, she was in school five, six years after me. And so that's how I met her. And to me, that was immediately a flag of somebody who was a hard worker because yeah. you had to take 15, 20 extra credit hours to do that dual major because there wasn't a perfect overlap of the prereqs. Oh, Leo wants to say hi now. He's eating Oreos. Oh, no. you got an or oh dude, Oreos, man. Rockstar. Yeah. He's probably going to lick the uh, inside and then throw away the, the outside. Ah, that's all right. That's so the best part. So I had met Megan when she was in college and I hired her at Fortune once I was, you know, a manager level and could hire some people. And I had trained her there on, you know, how to do rankings and a lot of the data work that I do. And so when I left to start Resi Club, she was immediately one of the first people that popped in my mind to hire. Uh, she has a great work, work ethic, really good researcher. And so she joined Resi Club two weeks ago. And one of the first projects I wanted her to do was to reach out to all the research firms to get their studies on if the U.S. housing market is overbuilt or if it's underbuilt. And so 15 years ago, a lot of these research firms uh, had had calculations showing that the U.S. housing market was overbuilt. 
over. Oh, yeah. 15 years ago. Um, yeah. yeah. And by a few million homes. And while home prices weren't falling or anything like that, the studies were showing that we had more supply than was needed for demand. Mm -hmm. And so we reached out and we got all these studies. And what we found is that of the 11 studies, they all have one conclusion. The U.S. housing market is underbuilt. And mm -hmm. it's actually interesting because some of them, like Realtor.com, uh, they think that the U.S. housing market uh, for multifamily is overbuilt, but then single family is underbuilt by like 6 million. And oh, so the I love that twist. Comes out yeah. to like 4 million when you bring it all together. I, actually, I got that wrong. They, they think that single is like 4 million underbuilt and that multi's overbuilt by like two. So it comes out to 2.3 underbuilt total. Okay. And so let me share my screen and share all these studies. Okay, so here it is. Here's all 11. And this this chart only goes out to Resi Club Pro members, my premium right. members. Yep. Uh, so this is actually some exclusive data. Fannie nice. Mae has it at 4.4 million. Zillow's 4.3. Uh, Bank of America's 4 million. And then as you go down, uh, JP Morgan's 2 million. John Burns is 1.7, Moody's is 1.7. Just, John is just so we could get our vocabulary correct, when it talks housing units, is this is this single family only or is this the collection of single and multi? It, it should be both, which is why okay, I think good. they say units, housing units. The Got only Perfect. one who specifies homes is John Burns uh, Research and Consulting. And even they might still be units. Okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, as far as I know, most of them. Perfect. It, it, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and actually, if you just narrowed it out to single family, there's a good chance that the numbers would actually grow because some that, of them. That's yes. That's where I was going is, is again, like we talked about in part one of our discussion with rents, right? Rents in multifamily are, I don't know, I'll call it weakening where single families are remaining on task right before and after the pandemic four percent roughly i think i think there is something to be said at least for the next two years with deliveries of multifamily being more than that what's required certainly in some cities and but i think single families generally speaking are undersupplied so i i i'm with you i think these numbers are higher if you just look at single families, because multifamily is overbuilt in some areas. And another thing that I did is if a group had a conservative estimate mm -hmm. and then also an aggressive estimate, I took the conservative one. So oh, Morgan Stanley, they said on a conservative basis, the under the U.S. housing market is underbuilt by 2 million homes, units. Okay. On an aggressive model, the estimate is 6 oh, million. Oh, wow. Yeah. 6 million. Okay. And the reason is, um, the reason that there's a good variation on the models is, and Mark Zandi got into this and explained it to Megan, is that some of the groups like John Burns and Moody's did deeper dives to find additional constraints to household formation. Because wow, one okay. of the things that Zillow da, did is they are a part of how they calculate it is they estimate that there's 8 million individuals or families who would prefer to live on their own, right? And so, so the demand side, they have 8 million for demand. Mm -hmm. And then there's 3.7 million housing units available for sale or rent. And I guess that's on a year. And so Correct, the yeah. difference between the two becomes 4.3 million. Mm. What Moody's and John Burns number kind of does is because of affordability and these other uh, calculations, they estimate that that demand is lower. Mm. And so oh, what, okay. that makes what, sense. what groups like Zillow are doing is they're saying that because there's not enough homes right now already in the market and it's driven mm -hmm. up affordability, there's actually 8 million people who want to own a home, but aren't because of there's not enough supply and affordability yeah. has deteriorated. Well, th this is an important point because, you know, you have an econ degree as I do. So for the audience, demand is a tricky two-step function. So in the example above with 8 million, there could be 8 million people that would have the desire 
to live in their own place, but demand also has to have the ability. So it's not only I want a Ferrari, but it's I have the ability to buy a Ferrari. And that's a much smaller number. So uh, it's interesting to look at demand that way. So 8 million being the big number and then some factor. And where this gets interesting is obviously as interest rates fall and or income goes up and or prices fall, that marginal demand just gets pulled off the sidelines. That's why I am personally deathly afraid of 5.99 mortgage rates this year. I think at some point the rates come down, we pull off marginal demand with no increase in marginal supply and stuff gets wild. That's like my fear for 2024. Yeah. Yeah. And so with the, with the one core thing to look at when it comes to housing is the bust um, mm -hmm. when it comes to construction, because one of the things that occurred in the last bust is that a lot of people think there was not only a correction, there was also an overcorrection where the market just got hit so hard that while, yeah, we needed to probably, you know, pull back a bit, maybe on construction, we pulled back too far because there right. got to be such a glut of existing homes on the market. Prices mm -hmm. fell so far, builders just couldn't do it. They couldn't, they couldn't compete. Dude, Lance, I was in a market where stuff was selling for land value. And yeah. there was a house on it. So, so builders couldn't, couldn't compete. So what happens when you have a home building depression like that in multi-years is it destroys your entire supply chain. Yeah, because for a decade at least. You have you know, all these different suppliers go out of business. You have the contractors. Dude, you know, roofers, the, painters. Yeah. It's all it gone. Gets, it just gets crushed. And so maybe it should have been a couple year correction or three year. It just went on too long. And you can see here, where in 2015, I mean, that's below, far below the building levels from 40 years before. Um, yeah. it, it just took so long to get it back up. Now, another thing that's interesting about this chart, and last thing before we jump, mm -hmm. is that we had a mortgage rate shock last year, yep. right? Yep. Or Well, it's actually been two years now. Time's going kind of fast. <laughs> and we saw a pullback in starts for multifamily and single family. But what occurred is once builders made the adjustments yep. in terms of like the mortgage rate buy downs and what were the sweet spots in the market and money mm -hmm. back and, and all that stuff, housing starts for single families ripped back up yeah. and, so, and multi stayed very suppressed still. And there's a big rollover happening there in the marketplace. For sure. Um, so I, I think uh, that is also a signal uh, that the market is still, you know, at least chasing single family homes that there's I demand. I couldn't agree more. I think this conversation has been great. Single family versus multifamily rents. They're different stories. Then looking at housing development, this chart in the 11 predictions is awesome. Glad to see Resi Club is growing. Somebody wanted to check out Resi Club. Where should they go? Yeah, uh, Google Resi Club Analytics uh, com. You'll find my website. If you Google uh, at News Lambert, my Twitter handle and for Resi Club, I both have a free multi-issues uh, a week newsletter, and then I have a pro one, which gets more data, extra charts, three additional articles per week. And you know, one last thing before we jump, and I, sure. I always have like three one last things. That's but okay. We have a ton of multifamily supply coming into the market this year, and then yep. a harder rollover the next couple. Yeah, no, this is something that Ken McElroy has been talking about. He's like, hey, we're going to have a rough couple of years in multifamily given the debt blow up and deliveries. But after that, it rolls over. Supply's not coming and they're not building anymore. And so the reason I think that matters is also for the economy, where if we stay restrictive for longer and, you know, you're starting to get some people thinking now because we've went through the rate hiking cycle so far and haven't had a recession. Some of the people don't think we can have recessions anymore. Yeah. Uh, kind of <laughs> but if, if multi rolls over really hard and yeah. some of the things in the economy that were financed at low interest rates are gone, yeah. and then you start to see a pullback in, you know, job cuts and multi yep. residential construction on the multifamily side, that could start to be a headwind for the economy, which Agreed. is probably something the feds are already thinking about and why, you know, they're probably going to start cutting rates before we even get to 2% handle for CPI. Oh, for sure. They don't know how this works. They probably want to start to get out of restrictive sooner than later.
Yeah, as, they, as they've often told us during this rate increase, there is uh, variable and variable lags. And there's also variable lags on the downside. So yeah, they'll be cutting long before we're at 2%. Lance, you're amazing. Thank you for saying yes to coming out to our event this weekend. I know a lot of people are going to want to shake your hand, take a picture. Uh, so uh, so get ready. I'm you're, you're one of the biggest, biggest names coming to the event. So thank you so much. Super excited. And thank you for the invite. You got it.